Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Daniel Rivers, the Partnerships Director for AM Opportunities, and we're very honored to have uh, Dr. Adam Atut and Dr. Weissman here uh, with us and maybe some others who will join and answer questions. If you have questions and you're joining us live, feel free to post your questions in the chat. Now, the programs uh, that you will be hearing about uh, can be done individually, but really are better as group cohorts. So if your uh, school would like to participate or you would like to find out if your school would like to participate, feel free to contact an advisor and mention which school you are at. Uh, myself and my colleague here, Austin, are in touch with hundreds of medical schools across the United States and the world. Uh, and we'd be happy to work with your school on organizing a cohort of students. With that said, I'll turn it over to Austin and Dr. Atu. Sure, thank you, Daniel. Um, hi, everyone. As Daniel said, I work with AM Opportunities. Uh, I work very closely with Daniel. Um, we are kind of a middleman for you to think of uh, between you and clinical experiences. So we host an online platform where students like yourself can find their clinical experiences and sort through them and uh, find the ones that, uh, that fit your needs. Um, I'm here again today with Dr. Atu, who has some programs on our website, who he would love to talk to you about his programs. So Dr. Atu, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey everybody, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Dr. Adam Atu, I'm the Residency Program Director for the Transitional Year Residency at uh, Hackensack Meridian Palisades Hospital. Um, I also uh, teach at the medical school and I'm a core faculty member of internal medicine and um, family medicine uh, residency programs at the hospital. Um, so, um, you know, we have a couple of programs that I think would be useful to um, some of the graduates and the medical students. So to increase your chances now of, of matching, clinical experience, I feel, is, is quite crucial, especially high level clinical experience. Um, so we offer um, clerkships in, in multiple departments that we have in many different specialties. And, um, you know, so, so if any of you guys are interested, either in virtual or in person, we do offer that. Um, I think the type of clerkships that you have, the quality and the type of preceptor that you have is extremely important. Uh, as a residency program director, I always look to see, okay, when you get a letter of recommendation, not only the contents of it, because I think majority of LORs are overwhelmingly positive. Uh, I look to see like, where was it done? What the person's title is? Um, was it done in an academic institution? Was it done in a community center? Uh, I think those things matter. Uh, was it done with a program director, a chair of a department, uh, or a faculty member versus a community doctor that's not necessarily academically involved? Um, and, and, then, um, and then also we offer some research opportunities too for those of you that need help with that. Uh, how to do research, we throw you on research teams in order to help you assist in you know, broadening that horizon and getting more publications for the match. Sure, sure. So that's a great answer. You said a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. So. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask, you know, a few follow up questions. Um, you know, something you talked about was letters of recommendation, and you said that a lot of them can be overly positive. So I'm here wondering, what does the best letter of recommendation look like to you? So I'm going to be honest with you, the, the substance of it isn't necessarily as important as who wrote it only because I, I don't know, like, I, I, we read maybe like, a thousand letters of recommendations a year. And I have still yet to find one that said, this person is not the greatest thing on earth, right? So it's usually like the person was a great doctor. So if everybody's great, then the letter content itself isn't as meaningful. But for example, if you get a letter from a chair of a department or you get a letter from a core faculty member, then I, I know that those people, their job includes more academic medicine. So therefore you must have experienced academic medicine you know, while working with them, right? Um, so it, I, I really care more about like the department person who, who did you work with specifically? What did you do when you were with them, right? Um, and, um, and maybe like, you know, the title of the person uh, that you work with. That's really what the most important thing as far as the letter is concerned. Sure. And just to follow up, um, we have sure. a lot of concern from students who they, you know, maybe have this idea that doing virtual rotations won't get them as good of a letter of recommendation. Uh, do you have any sort of pushback on that where you can 
uh, you know, prove yeah. that from your perspective, virtual rotations can be a quality learning experience for students? Yeah, I, I think I think with COVID, right, if one thing was proven is that, you know, telemedicine is an effective way of taking care of patients in, in, in certain contexts, and it's here to stay. It's definitely not going anywhere. Uh, it has become embedded as part of our teaching. We now even teach our residents how to do telemedicine, you know, uh, visits in their in their residency. So tele-rotations, guys, um, you know, every program director will understand that that due to COVID, that things change all the time. And so the ability to get an in-person rotation is somewhat difficult, especially for international graduates. So um, the fact that somebody from like, let's say Bangladesh or whatever, who couldn't, for example, afford to come to the United States or afford to, you know, get a flight and stay here and pay for a rotation was went out of their way to do a tele-rotation. I mean, for me, that's meaningful because they could have just simply used it as an excuse and say, okay, I couldn't afford it, so I'm not gonna do it, right? But no, they, they did at least a tele-rotation. To me, that still holds a lot of value. And especially what kind, what did you do during that time? Did you just sit there and watch someone or did you have an academic discussion about patient care, right? Like, like we offer a tele-version of a rotation and in that you have high-level discussions about patient care, detailed discussion, right? Um, I think that that's very valuable. And um, if you can do an in-person, I think it's better. But if, if you wanna, do mostly tele and sprinkle in a couple of in-person, that's okay too. Sure, I mean, I love pushing, you know, tele rotations because they're more accessible to students. I think right. a lot of students face barriers when doing in-person rotations and uh, virtual is, it opens up a whole new world. So I'm happy that they're becoming more common. I'm happy that you offer some. And you know, one, one thing is that like right now there's a movement in the residency programs to provide more equity like equitable, like, like if we see that somebody has, um, let's say economic barriers as a resident, a student, right? Where like, let's say they don't have access to certain funds to be able to fly to a place or, or um, pay for a rotation. You know, this, this is becoming more understandable on the program director level where we understand, like if, if they ask you, hey, why didn't you do an in-person rotation and you opted just for a telly, if you tell them, listen, funds were tight and this is all I could afford, I don't think anybody will hold that against you, right? And, and the fact that you went out of your way to do it is still a very positive, impactful thing. Um, so I, I, I support it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a discussion from administrators, school administrators, as well as hospital administrators about equity versus equality. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, most people today are on board, especially in hospitals about, um, you know, prioritizing equity and making sure that everyone has access to, to the things that they need. Um, sure. Um, I, another question I have for you is, why is it important to have research experience specifically when applying to the U.S. residency match? Okay, so that, that's a very important question. So number one, when we used to, like our program, used, we get about 3,500 applications a year for about 18 positions. Um, we used to use one of the things that we used to filter was the step one score and the step two score. But now step one has become pass fail, which shifts the emphasis of your CV because we can't use it as a filter anymore. It shifts it to step two. And we have to find something else to separate these 3,500 applicants, right? So what could you use as a program director to separate these individuals, right? To, to, to tier them. Well, the step two score is obviously one. Um, the clinical experience they have. And the on, really the only thing left is pretty much the letters of recommendation and the research they have, right? Every program, right? By like, you know, when, when, uh, when ACGME comes to like accept our reports at the end of the year, how the program is doing, they ask for how many publications did your program produce? So every program director wants to have residents that are familiar with research or at the minimum interested in, right? So maybe you came from a school that doesn't have a research department, but you did a research rotation and you're, you're somewhat interested. You show that you're willing to do it if you're taught how. So for me, that's a positive, right? And that's why like now having at least like a couple of publications helps and the more the better, right? The more the better. Sure. And, and since I have you here, it's a really good opportunity for students to learn more about your specific rotation. So I was yeah. wondering, if, is there anything that you could say to the viewers who are watching this live and pre-recorded about if they were to reserve rotations with you, what would they be learning? Who would they be studying with? Um, could you speak a little bit more about your specific program? Yeah, so I mean, like my my program is pretty much like I work with my residents, right? 
um, and they're actually, I'm surrounded by them right now. They're, they're laughing at me. Um, we have uh, externs that come and they join us. And the idea is we want the externs to have as an academic experience as possible. They work hand in hand with the residents. Um, we look at patients together. We figure out like what's the best plan going forward. So I think a hands-on approach is very important. And if they see how a program, a residency program functions, they're much more likely to, you know, be more successful residents when they match. Um, so that's one aspect. We have a virtual option for people that can't, for example, don't have the ability to come in person. Um, so uh, where we go through cases that we saw in the hospital, let's say difficult cases, and we show how the patient presented and we go in detail about how to, how to help those patients out so they can learn those cases as well. Um, and then as far as the research option, I think Dr. Wiseman will talk to you guys about that. Mm -hmm. And since you have um, some of your students there around with you, I was just wondering, is there any way that you could maybe turn the camera around real quick and maybe they could say a few words if they're comfortable, but if they're not, then I yep. totally have more yeah, questions right. for you. Go for it. Lights, camera, action. Hi. Hi. Do you have any words that maybe potential students who might want to be in your position, they would like to hear if they want to apply to reserve? A rotation like yours? Um, in what sense? I'm sorry, can you? Sure, sure. Like to any potential students who might want to reserve a, a clinical rotation, the one like yours, do you have any advice for them on what to look for or like what they might learn in a rotation like yours? I mean, in a rotation like this, where you get to go to didactics with residents, you get to see do hospital rounds, you get to see inpatient and outpatient. I feel like that's very valuable. Um, many rotations for, especially IMGs, have been strictly outpatient. So to have a rotation that has such variety, plus um, being in close contact with people who are learning on an everyday basis with residents, with interns, with people in transition year, I think it's very helpful. Sorry, our masks are on because we're in the office. <laughs> Can I ask a question? What are, is the patient population? Is it very diverse? And do you get to experience lots of different types of conditions? Um, you know, what is the, the kind of patient makeup in, in the area? In this particular rotation? I mean, many, in most places, you would have a diverse uh, patient population. Each area is going to be different. Um, my last rotation had a large Vietnamese population. Here, we have people from everywhere. It's New Jersey. So, I mean, I think in many places in the state of go, you get a big variety of patient population. I just ask because we do have some international uh, medical students here who, who might not be as familiar. Yes. Sure, and thank you guys for, for answering the question. I didn't mean to put you on the spot at all, but I do appreciate you being so willing. You're fired, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, they did great. I'm super happy to have them here. You know, that's an opportunity that I think doesn't happen very often. So I wanted to take advantage of it. Um, just real quick, um, I just wanted to go back to the letters of recommendation, since it's uh, such yeah. an important way that you can filter out students. Um, does it state in the letter of rec that uh, experience was virtual? And if it does state it, is that something that uh, resident directors um, like look down on? Or is it something that you know, maybe could enhance an application? Um, I think, it, so the letter of recommendation should describe like what you did, right? I mean, it's it, it shouldn't say that you were in person when you weren't. There's nothing wrong with that. Just own up to being in, on, in a virtual. And there, I don't I don't think it holds any less value um, than if you did it in, in, a, in an in-person. I think academically for you, like if you were trying to network and like increase your physical, like strength, obviously being in the room with the patient we can all agree it's, it's probably better than you being on a computer screen, right? Mm -hmm. However, if, if there's a particular rotation that you're really interested in, like there's no spot except the virtual, there's nothing wrong with that. We will not hold it against you. It's just, what did you do through it? What did you learn from it, right? Uh, were you able to, you know, get something positive out of it? That's fine. Yeah, but, but no, we do not look down on that at, at all. Okay, good. That's good to hear because we get that question a lot. I, I yeah. cannot tell you. I'm going to tell you guys, I think a lot of like IMGs, and this is this is one of the things we do here, and this is why I, I'm glad you guys are allowing us to have this type of access. Like, I think a lot of people worry about things that genuinely do not matter, right? So like we get questions like, is the letter of recommendation on a hospital letterhead? 
again, I can genuinely care less. As a program director, I can care less what letterhead it's on, right? I care about more who wrote it. So if he wrote it and he put an office letterhead or a community letterhead or a university letterhead, it does not, it does not matter, genuinely. But people obsess over these little details, right? Um, the most important thing is who are you working with? What experience are you getting out of it? And are you maximizing your effort during it? That's really about it, right? And then research, right? Like if you're doing that, are you publishing or are you simply just doing research and, and not, nothing's coming out of it? At the end of the day, you wanna publish something, right? So, um, so you wanna be more goal oriented in what you're doing. That's about it. Sure. Um, actually, my next question was going to be about research. So I'm glad you brought that up because um, you mentioned that there's research opportunities at your program. Um, do you think that um, students who have no research experience at all prior to your program could still sign up? Or do you think that they have to have some sort of research experience prior to signing up for your program? No, we created this program specifically for students that don't know how to do research because we want to teach you how to do it. So if, you're, if you came from a medical school that does not have a research program, right? The chances of you knowing how to do research is slim. So at the beginning, the, few, the first few weeks are just lectures to teach you like, what is the difference between a case report and a manuscript? What is the difference between an abstract and a poster, right? Um, how do you begin to approach that? And, and then once we do that and you learn the basics, then we put you on a team with like our residents and we, we come up with papers together. And the idea is by the end of the rotation, you have some publication, hopefully, um, and uh, we go from there. Sure. But the idea is to teach you how to do it from scratch. So by the time you match, you're comfortable. Great. And um, we do have a lot of students on these webinars who are, you know, maybe second or third year students still where they don't know what type of specialty they want to go into. Yeah. Do you think that um, if they were to choose programs like yours or maybe just clinical experiences in general, do you think it helps them decide which specialty they want to go to in the end? I do. I think I think like obviously the best way to know if you like something is to do it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I think internal medicine is the best, but I'm biased. But, um, you know, um, but yeah, I mean, if you're not sure about a field, try to do a rotation in it. And then that way you figure out, can I see myself doing this or not? Sure. Uh, what can I, uh, what, what do you look for most in, in a visitor? You know, whether they're a U.S. medical student, international medical student, a graduate, you know, what are you looking mm -hmm. for uh, in that person? You know, how can they prepare in advance or, or is there nothing to prepare? It's all about when you arrive, mm -hmm. this is what I want to see. So there's a lot you could do to prepare. So look, um, I don't mean to like gas this rotation up, but at the end of the day, like um, ultimately, if you're working with a program director or an associate PD, that's your chance at potentially like matching, right? Like if you impress somebody, like a lot of the residents that we take into our rotations uh, are people that we work with directly, right? And that's typical of anything. Like if you look at most residency programs, a lot of the students they match are medical students from the schools that are they're affiliated with because that's who they work with, right? They know that James was really good. Susie was like really good. Okay, let's take her rather than take some um, generic person over ERAS that we're not actually familiar with that we maybe interviewed for 30 minutes, right? If you could prove you're good here and you could fix, you, you fit well with the residents, like why wouldn't we take you, right? So how do you do that? How do you prove yourself to be good? Well, if you're an older graduate, the most important thing, in my opinion, is make sure your medical knowledge is up to date. Right? So that's something that when they're here, they're not just sitting at the chair. We're constantly discussing literature. We're pulling up like reports on the computer. We're discussing like what's the most up-to-date information. If I see that you graduated four years ago, but you don't know the basics of something that you should at, at your level of training know, then I know that you're not really reading when you're not here, right? So that means you're probably not the type of person we want. So, so, so what can you do? Well, join a journal, journal subscription, right? We have something called MedComplete, for example, where you can join our didactic sessions in the hospital, right? Every week for, for a year. So that way you're up to date on information. You're welcome to sign up for it, right? Um, if you're constantly reading, then when you show up, you impress us, you're like at the level of the resident. Okay, that's, that's a huge plus. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like our chief resident who's with us right now was one of them, right? He joined as an extern, was phenomenal in his medical knowledge. Um, and we matched him and then he became the chief resident in the hospital. We're going to fire him soon, but, you know. Sure. Um, I, yeah. I think that's going to be exciting news for a lot of students who are watching this webinar, just yeah. to hear that sometimes, uh, maybe not every time, it's not a guarantee, obviously, but I'm sure that a lot of people would like to match at where they did their rotations, make it a lot smoother, 
you'd probably be a lot more comfortable with the work that you're doing. <clears throat> I think that they'll, excuse me, they'll be excited to, to hear that that's, you know, at least an opportunity in their future. Agreed. Um, you know, like I said, though, we do have a lot of students who are still, you know, in the first few years of medical school. So do you think that it's a good idea for these students to start early and get these clinical experiences early as opposed to waiting until they graduate? Um, I think I think if you're in medical school, like you have, to, you, I mean, your curriculum is pretty much created for you in your second and third year, right? So most schools, like your third year, you have to rotate through the cores, which are mandatory for graduation. And then in your fourth year is really when you pick up your electives. So um, I think this, like the jumping into the rotations a little bit early applies in my opinion more to externs like who graduated rather than ones that are in medical school at that time because during med school like you're you know you will most likely progress at the timeline that your school uh expects you to sure and and do you think that um students who rotated through your program or any clinical experience in general do you think that they can get updated letters of recommendation a few years after their experience, for example, if they're a third year student and they do a clinical, but they never got their LOR, when it comes time to apply, do you think that they could still um, get an updated LOR so that they could use their experiences when they apply? Um, it's a good question. I never really thought about that. But like, so you mean like, let's say they rotate now and in three years, they ask me to upload that same letter again? Sure. Just for an example. Yeah, that works. I don't see why not. I don't see why not. Um, if I still have it, <laughs> I mean, usually like I don't, I don't know if we'll keep them for that long. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, we our our letter will say though that they rotated with us in like three years ago. I'm not sure how meaningful that will be, as opposed mm -hmm. to like a more you rotated with us recently. You know what I mean? Sure, sure. I and, see Dr. Weissman joined, and we we do have a question from the audience uh, yeah. around research. And I know you you have to cut out Dr. Atuja, yeah. so. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank you very much for your time and uh, sure great enough. information, great information, very valuable information for our audience. No, it's my pleasure. I'll see you guys soon, okay? Good luck, okay. everyone. Take care. Thank you, Thanks doctor. so much. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Daniel. I'm trying to start my video. It's telling me that I'm unable to start video. You can't start video because the host has stopped it. Is there is there a way I can- Yeah, you are now a co-host. You can start your video. And uh, we'll allow you to introduce yourself. Uh, and I don't know if you can see the questions in the Q&A section, but there's already a question that came in about research. So uh, I'll let you, you know, go ahead and introduce yeah. yourself and then uh, maybe you can touch on that question if you can see it. Sure, thank you, thank you, Daniel, and thank you for the opportunity and, and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Weissman, Simcha Weissman. Um, <clears throat> I am one of the faculty members of the internal medicine program here in New Jersey, part of the Hackensack Network. Um, I also help the res the residents and the fellows with research. I'm the director of the clinical research department here. Um, and a lot of what I do is um, I, I use um, either, either an interesting case in the hospital that came up or um, something I want to submit as an abstract to a conference or a, a, a retrospective study we're working on and get a group of students. We communicate via WhatsApp um, and we really work on the paper. I teach about methodology, I teach about writing, and together we work on the paper and we submit it for publication after the month. Um, we've been very successful. We've had a lot of um, uh, um uh, manuscripts published in high impact factor um, journals, PubMed Index, um, and it's something that really, really helps for ERAS because now step one is pass fail. So because step one is pass fail, they're going to rely more on research, more on letters recommendation, more on yourself. And I always tell people this is a way of showing it without telling. You want to show them you're interested without. And uh, Dr. And as far as research is concerned, uh, like you said, step one is now pass fail. So step two CS was canceled. The step step two CK is kind of the only score there. Um, are there any other scores like that that are looked at, like the occupational yeah. English test or, or something else? Or is it really just yeah. you're looking at did you pass step one on your first yeah. try? Did you? Um, uh Yeah. So, so unfortunately, not. Yeah. So so unfortunately, yeah, let me just.
<clears throat> Daniel, are you still here with me? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. So I believe it's Dr. Wiseman's internet. I'll give him just a minute. If, if he doesn't come back on, I will I'll try to answer the questions in the chat based on my knowledge. I've spoken with many residency directors throughout my time with AMO. Um, so let me um, see if I can turn my video on and make sure it's, it looks okay here. Oh, here, he's coming back. So let's try that again. So it's a great question. Um, and the answer is no, there's no other score, which is why some programs are now filtering based on like research. So if you don't have like, sometimes they set their thing to one or two publications or, um, you know, research uh, manuscripts. And if you don't have that, you just will be filtered out. So that this is becoming more and more popular now because um, there's no other scores to go off. There's only a step two CK because there's no CS and there's no step one. So it changes the playing field. It changes the dynamics and you have to adapt. Um, so to speak. <laughs> Do you feel this makes the residency match more holistic and more kind of uh, open to applicants that, you know, let's say I had poor scores in medical school, but I have a ton of research. I've published research, a lot of uh, rotations with top uh, letters of recommendation and a high step two CK score. Can that kind of balance out kind of poor performance in one area and make up for it in another. Absolutely. Way. Absolutely. And that's, that's go, that goes into the, the part of the reason why they did it um, is because they want to try now to say, I don't want that genius who got like a two, you know, 60 on step one. I, I, I want, yes, I want a score. I want clinical step two score. And eventually step two is going to be pass fail too, by the way, I don't know when, but eventually, but they, what they want now is to say, okay, I want somebody who's a great communicator. I want somebody who um, has good clinical experience. I want someone who's interested in scholarly academic activity, like research publications. And this is what they're looking for. Um, it goes to some people's advantage and goes against some people based on their personality. Overall, it's good for students who, who are really good doctors and, and care about medicine, but they're just not great test takers. So I think it can help, yeah. Sure. And, and Dr. Wiseman, you can feel free to turn off your video if it'll help your, your connection. There's no pressure to keep it on. <clears throat> um, I think, yeah, that's okay. I'm not sure if that affects it or not. Fine. Okay. And, and, and Daniel, did you have a follow-up question to that or would you like me to ask a few? Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm sorry, my video's off. I can turn it on. Um, uh, good to see you, Dr. Wiseman. And uh, we're, we're working with many medical schools across the U.S. and across the world, you know, do you feel it's helpful, let's say for an international school, uh, something maybe in Ireland, for a group of students to participate in the research together, or having kind of individual students just choose their own programs? I think yeah, Dr. Yeah, Weiss, that's oh, go ahead. Yeah. Maybe I would suggest pausing your video because your bandwidth might be a little bit low. Okay, so we'll go like that. Um, that's a so the is um, kind of on a team, and one of the things they like love, that you're an eight, ten other research team. And they yeah, we're, we're not hearing you. It's not oh, we lost him. <laughs> That's okay. Daniel, do you think that you could maybe take a crack at your own question? Uh, well, you know, I'd really like to hear from Dr. Weissman. I mean, New Jersey is one of the okay, friendliest yeah. states. Oh, okay. I was just saying that New Jersey is a very friendly okay. state for IMGs and that uh, not only that, but your health system, the hospital you work at is very highly regarded. And so, you know, a lot of times uh, our visitors, whether they come from Ireland or U.S. medical school, they're, they're looking for the top names. And, uh, you know, so I was just kind of filling in here while, while we were waiting for your response. Yeah, 
yeah okay yeah so thank you daniel so my, my internet is much better now so so like this um i i think to answer your question cohorts are good um it also allows um other thoughts on a paper um it allows people from different parts of the world to collaborate everyone has different thoughts to share um it allows us to um work as a team and that's one of the things they like to see is a team player somebody who could kind of work on a team and still stand out and still get along with everyone on the team so it's, it's definitely commendable now, Dr. Toot said that because everyone we speak with, all of our visitors say, is this LOR going to be on hospital or university letterhead? And he basically said that doesn't matter. It, it matters the content, you know, and if it's a research, you know, sort of clinical experience, did you get published? Uh, who did you work with? Um, so just more, more, anything more you could say on that, because uh, we're always feeling like we're trying to convince uh, you know, medical students in their final years or those recent graduates that are getting ready to apply for the match. No, this is what you need. Uh, but that, you know, the mindset is it, it must be this. And uh, maybe you can kind of touch upon some of those issues. Yeah. And, and this is, this is, I, and I agree and I support what, what, you know, what he said. However, I will say that, um, you know, uh, people have in mind hospital because they think residencies are in the hospital. So I need a hospital at because you know, that's where residencies are. That's medicine. I will tell you, most people who graduate residency practice outpatient medicine. Most of internal and family medicine is outpatient. So actually, it could look good for you if you have a, a, a letterhead, which is in the clinic, um, because it shows that you did medicine, which will be practiced a lot in residency and after residency. So it actually, if you have only hospital, they'll say, do you have any experience in the clinic? Like, and, and, and I think that's a notion missed. And I would encourage at least one letter in the clinic. If you want to get one in the hospital, fine. I think it's a little overdone. The hospital letterhead, hospital letterhead. Um, it, it, it's just overdone, in my opinion. I, I think people want to see experience in the clinic as well. And, and there's no better way to show it than a, a letter that you worked in an office, in a clinic, and you saw the private patients of a doctor, et cetera. And you got along with the staff and the patients. Just to be clear, um, coming from you rather than myself, uh, maybe you can tell our, our international audience how much of healthcare in the United States is practiced in a uh, clinic private practice versus a uh, hospital setting, maybe as a percentage, yeah. if, if you have an idea. I have an idea, but coming from you. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's good. And that's an important point to mention is that most of medicine, and I would say 90 90 percent of medicine, 85 to 90 percent of medicine is outpatient. The only reason we send patients to hospital is if they're very, very sick. Most of our patients were preventing from getting very, very sick. So most of medicine in the States is outpatient. And that's how everyone wants it to be. The insurance companies, the doctors, you don't want to treat a patient once he comes to the hospital. You want to avoid him from coming to the hospital. And that's where our, our, our money should be spent and, and healthcare should be focused. And that's why the residency programs now are spending more and more time training patients in the clinic. And they have more and more electives that are outpatient than inpatient because of this. So it's a trend happening to match where the needs are in the country. Um, there's no need for hospital medicine. There's a need for outpatient medicine, primary care doctors, outpatient. That's where we're falling short. And that's what residency want to see. So, yeah. And, and when Dr. Weissman says falling short, falling short by big numbers and not just yeah. in the U.S., but worldwide. So uh, something to consider. And if someone's planning on pursuing, I don't know, let's just pick a specialty, uh, uh, I don't know, surgery, should all the research be in surgery? Um, is that uh, very important, somewhat important, or less important as compared to is it published and who did you work with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a good point. So it's always good. One of the big things to portray about yourself is you have interest in the field you're applying. So if you're applying for ob show interest in ob -GYN. You're applying for surgery, show interest in surgery. How do you do that? Yeah, research and surgery. If you also have research in internal medicine, medicine, sure, it can't hurt you, can't hurt you, but you, you should definitely get it in the fields you're interested in. Austin, I, you feel free to take one. I'm just going off of the questions coming in the chat. One person said, I am an IMG and I work with big pharma as a clinical researcher. Does that help my ARIAS application? And before you answer, I'll, I'll tell you what I say. Everything you do counts. But for the U.S. residency match, you, you have to have letters of recommendation and experience from the United States. So I, I don't know where you're doing uh, your big pharma uh, clinical research, but, but anything in, in healthcare and showing your passion for medicine is going to be helpful. Uh, but it may not be something you can list on the application. It may be something you talk more about in your interview. Uh, Dr. Weissman, your thoughts? 
Yeah, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. I think people say, does this help? Does it help? The answer is yes. Everything you do helps. Everything. I mean, if you walk dogs, that doesn't help. But 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 like if you're gonna do, if you're gonna you know work as a as a as a nurse practitioner, or you worked as a nurse before, or you did a research in another field, or you worked in a farm, like these are all things that yeah, sure they help. Is it is it better to maybe have a publication on your app on your ERAS? Of course. But if you worked in a farm, sure that helps put it down the ERAS. You know. Sure. Um, I just want to let you use this opportunity to speak a little bit about your program specifically, Dr. Wiseman. So um, do you think that there's anything that students could get from your program that they wouldn't be able to get in other programs probably? Yeah. So, so, you know, so again, just to talk about mine briefly. So I, I it's a good opportunity because what I do is um, I, I, I kind of have some experience with publishing and writing things up and I teach some of the principles about how to write up papers. Um, and then we, we were very successful in publishing. And I think that's unique to be able to say this was submitted for publication on ERAS or this was accepted for publication versus just, oh, I worked on a paper. You know what I mean? There's a, there's a big difference there. So that's what you want at A and then B with our virtual clinical rotation. So we, we do virtual internal medicine and we teach a lot of the core principles that sometimes are asked on residencies themselves. Like the, the program director will ask you these questions and we kind of prepare you for your audition rotations or externships in person by teaching you a lot of the bread and butter cases of medicine from faculty that train residents. So it's another thing to consider when you're talking about our virtual clinical rotations. Sure. And I'll take that. Can I oh, take as the next question from, from the audience? Um, what about current residents looking for rotations or fellowship? What must they do to join these programs? So uh, I mean, this webinar is really around this particular research program, but as a, a company and as our mission, uh, AM Opportunities works to create access to clinical rotations, observerships, and research programs all across the United States. You can view our platform, you can see the programs, um, and, and you can apply. Um, lastly, who can they liaise with to help address this and embark on joint research? Um, so there's there's two ways to do this, and, and Dr. Weiss would please correct me if if I say anything misstep. But you know our our platform is open. You can apply to any research program on there. Some are only for graduates. Some are uh, allow for later year medical students, and some are even open to earlier medical students. You can also go through and email uh, residency directors or different doctors that are involved in research directly. Um, but the you know, that takes a lot of work and time, and they may or may not respond to your emails, which where the AM Opportunities platform is kind of a guaranteed access to, to that particular experience. What are your thoughts, Dr. Weissman, yeah. about any emails you've received over the years? Do you yeah. respond to you? Yeah, yeah, it's better. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good point. I mean, you know, you, you want accessibility. It's always a key, you know, programs are very busy. They're likely not going to read it, I'm definitely not going to respond. So, you know, if you can just get access through a company, um, it's a great platform to join into any program they have offered. And you can also see their site, see what they have available, see what's not available, and you can just pick what, what fits your needs. So. And, and I just wanted to go back to your earlier point. You were just talking about how you have a lot of experience with research and with publishing. I just wanted to restress that it's very hard to be published if you're a researcher. It takes so much work. And I don't think many medical students realize how many steps you have to go through when you're researching and you want to be published. So um, I would like to stress to the medical students in the audience that if Dr. Weissman has this experience and he knows how to get published, that's a really good opportunity for you because um, I can't tell you how many students I know have worked on a paper but just have never been published even after several years. So that's an amazing experience that I hope you guys can all take advantage of. And with that being said, I had another question. Um, if a student were to reserve a rotation um, doing research under you, what do you think a successful student would look like? Like, how would they come prepared yeah. to be successful in that position? Yeah, that, thank you, uh, Austin. And these are good points. Um, just come willing to learn, willing to work. Um, we're not expecting you to know much. We do teach and we train and I, I kind of walk through step by step how to go through the process. So just come willing to learn, willing to work, willing to work on a team and you'll be fine. Oh, Daniel, go ahead if you had a question. No, I don't have any further questions. I think you really covered it all very well, Dr. Weissman, not only the, the current situation, but what's been brought on by the pandemic, the changes in USMLE and with the residency match and where that's going in the future with possibly even step two CK score being eliminated and it just being truly a holistic approach where you have to show yourself through 
uh, the clinical rotations, research, and LORs you've received over the years um, and really make a case for yourself and, and your passion for that particular specialty, your passion for medicine. Um, and, you know, I know there's a lot of controversy over what's good, what's not, but it is what it is. And this is the direction we're going in. So I, I just really appreciate you joining and your thoughts. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and and welcome. Thank you, everyone, and we're more than happy to to speak to you more about it, and just reach out and reserve. And I'm sure you'll you know have a great experience. Thanks so much for your time, and and have a great day. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank All the best. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, Daniel, do you think that um, since we have a few minutes, do you think maybe I should show some medical students what? Uh, you know, the AMO platform really is so that they can get a feel for what it looks like? Yeah, well, actually, I uh, have a link in the chat. So I just want to, maybe I can um, go through that here. I'll, I'll open it up and, and share my screen with you all. Um, and if there's any certain slides you wanted to go over, feel free. Uh, and if you have questions about uh, these programs, you know, I saw one, one of you are in Chicago. Um, you know, it's not that we don't have programs in Chicago, but I'm just going over Dr. Weissman's program right now. This is Hackensack Meridian Health, Palisades Medical Center, New Jersey, very IMG friendly state, but also friendly for U.S. Uh, medical students as well. Uh, great state uh, to, to do your residency in. And every program is going to go over what are the academic affiliations? What are the hospital affiliations? You know, AM Opportunities is not a placement company. We don't place you into any program. We are a network of clinical sites that you can read about, apply to, and the complete description was given to us by those clinical sites, uh, just like Dr. Atut and Dr. Weissman. So this is not marketing material. This is just fact provided by them about their program. So you can read about the expectations. Uh, what are you going to learn? What are you going to have the opportunity to do during this four week program? What is the exposure type? Uh, who it's best suited for? So originally programs like this were really only open to graduates. And as the changes with the US residency match came about, uh, doctors like the program director, Dr. Atut and Dr. Weissman started opening these programs to earlier and earlier year medical students. So you may think, why would uh, uh, an early year medical student want to start to get involved in research? Well, it all comes down to the U.S. residency match. You know, starting early, getting ahead, getting that experience under your belt for your resume, for the LORs, and for the U.S. residency match. Um, and having a kind of all over rounded uh, application. Uh, as you heard from Dr. Atut, not just hospital programs, maybe you have uh, one month virtual uh, uh, internal medicine where you've seen lots of patients, done different things, then maybe you come in person at a private practice, then you do a clinic, then you do a, a hospital. Well, now you can show you have different kinds of experience throughout the US healthcare uh, system. And, and also having some rural care is becoming more important now uh, because uh, uh, especially for IMGs, a lot of IMGs do match into more rural settings. Um, and so, you know, having some urban, you know, New York City, Chicago, LA, uh, it's, uh, Tampa, some, some city uh, experience, but also rural experience is very important. Uh, further description will be about how you are evaluated um, and then additional requirements. It's always important to read those additional requirements. Sometimes they're around certain immunizations. Sometimes they, they say, hey, we want you to write a letter of uh, why you want to apply to this program. So you might need to submit an extra letter. Um, so just read those additional requirements. Uh, nothing is too hard. Remember, anything that's up on the AMO platform has already been approved by the preceptors or the hospital or the system. It is available, it's guaranteed spots first come, first serve. So uh, when you apply, we will generally let you know within 48 hours if you are approved. And if you are approved, uh, then it's your decision if you want to reserve that particular program or not, or ask more questions. It will also go over the schedule. Now for this particular program, there is no schedule because it's research and it's kind of ongoing throughout the entire month. You're part of a WhatsApp group. So Depending on your time zone, you'll be getting messages in, sending messages out when you wake up. Um, so you really can't have a schedule for this type of clinical experience. 
Um, but most, uh, you know, rotations, whether they're virtual or in person, will have a set schedule. That's the doctor's schedule. You're, you're shadowing or following or doing an observership or hands-on rotation with that pre preceptor. So you're following their schedule. So I don't think we have to go over the full kind of webinar presentation, but that gives you sort of an overview on who we are, uh, why uh, preceptors really like to work with us. We help with uh, everything you need to get into that clinical experience, whether that is uh, if you are abroad, getting a visa, uh, housing. If you are a U.S. medical student, maybe you need housing in the new uh, city that you're doing this rotation in, uh, malpractice insurance, collecting all your documents, verifying your immunizations. A lot of these things are, are actually uh, administrative uh, processes that, that some clinical sites just don't have capacity to do. And that's why we actually enable clinical sites to open their doors uh, to medical students and graduates, both in the U.S. and globally. So I'd just like to thank everyone for joining. Uh, great information today from both Dr. Atut and Dr. Weissman. Uh, and I will send this recording to everybody as well. And uh, feel free to contact an advisor if you have any questions. I'll post that uh, email address in the chat. And it's, uh, it's free to schedule a meeting with an advisor, free to apply. Uh, we're just trying to create the access. Um, the prices are set by the clinical site. Um, so that that is a cost but it delivering healthcare education is very expensive um and you know medical yeah, get, getting you know seeing a doctor here in the united states if you're from abroad and don't know it's very expensive the most expensive in the world so um it's kind of that's that's the counterbalance you know medical education here is expensive but also uh, as a patient, uh, you know, it's the most expensive country to get healthcare services. So thank you all again for joining. Feel free to reach out to us for any questions. I don't know, Austin, any last words, but thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, I think this was a great webinar. Uh, both doctors had a lot of useful information. Um, they were both really prepared. I, I think that there's a lot that medical students could have gotten out of this. So I appreciate you guys taking the time to watch this, um, whether it's pre-recorded or whether you're here live, thank you so much. We will send a summary email to all of you, which has um, some more useful links, as well as a recording of, of today's session. So thank you all, and I hope you have a wonderful day.